of a brand do you want to get it in front of millions of people instantly well email me right now ogod at hip-hop un how do you like the way that hip-hop has evolved in particular with the women in hip-hop what is your message to the people about that well you know it's pretty interesting because um a lot of different uh, eras of thought have occurred since the beginning of hip hop. In other words, in the beginning, I think uh, you had like Roxanne, Shante, and you had like Sweet Tea, and um, you had all of these girls that were, you know, rhyme battling and you know, talking about their personal style and things like that. And I thought that was cool. And then after that, you, you had kind of uh, uh, the strong women presence like uh, Queen Latifah and Moni Love and MC Light, of course, you know. And then after that, you had like Foxy Brown and Little Kim, and it kind of switched from the strong woman to uh, the woman that, you know, is the the hustler's main chick. <laughs> and, you know, she does the hustler's bidding and, you know, she's a dime piece and yada, yada. And then after that, you kind of got into the more like the uh, uh, the Cardi B's and um, mm -hmm. the City Girls, you know. Uh, and then, of course, you had some variation because you have Young M.A. and, you know, some of the others. So you see really so many different levels of, of womanhood or what women perceive to be womanhood. And the main uh, theme is that I think that women want to be able to do whatever they want to do and say whatever they want to say and be whoever they want to be. But the impact has been uh, uh, the impact has been great in the sense of I I don't know uh, I think the young people are getting very mixed very confusing messages mm -hmm. from the female MCs to kind of to kind of back off oh excuse me to kind of piggyback back off. Into Santiago herself, um, written as a beautiful woman coming from a hustler background, a hustler herself, um, mm -hmm. and getting back into the game, coming back into life after death. Are people curious to whether or not she's going to get back into the game? How does that, um, and, and it's in fictional books, but written in reality, because a lot of people can relate to exactly what you're writing, even though the characters and the scenarios, quote unquote, may be fictional. How does that correlate or Winter Santiago to today's woman? And how did it correlate 20 years ago? Well, I think in Life After Death, you'll see that uh, Winter has some more options than just uh, hustling. Uh, but she still definitely has that same mindset that she had in the coldest winter ever. She doesn't really see anything wrong with it. Uh, she thinks that she did 15 years because she had a bad attitude, not because she did anything wrong. And she says clearly that she was innocent and she got arrested for an attitude when an attitude is not a crime. But the fact is that in America, you can get arrested for what is perceived as a bad attitude. <laughs> so um, I think that Winter has more options just like this young generation has more options. Uh, there's reality TV and video games and, you know, all kinds of different economic portals for young people to go through today that they were not able to go through before. So I think that you'll see that in life after death. Do you think that um, that uh, hip hop, you know, we, we were talking about, how you know, how the woman and the men kind of evolved, but you particularly talking about the woman. Do you think there's any any benefit, you know, to our children, our seeds listening to that type of music? Because like you have some people, it's not always like the uh Meg the Stallions and a Cardi. You got other artists, you know, who present a different message. So do you think the negative side of that is at all beneficial 
can we find any benefit in that at all? Should we kind of just turn that whole thing off? Well, you know, I'm not, I'm not controlling enough to tell people what to turn off or what to turn on, but I always like to give a message through all of the art that I do that your life matters and your soul matters and your choices matter and your actions matter. And I always feel bad if I see, you know, women who think that all they are is a sexual entity and nothing else. And even from when I was 21, I believe that the definition of a woman is to have 360 degrees of power, to be multidimensional. So your sexuality, of course, is part of it because that's nature, but there's so many other levels to your womanhood. So I'm always gonna appreciate the artists that accentuate and, and make it clear to young people that there are so many other dimensions to your womanhood and your manhood that you need to strive for um, than that one dimension of just being a sexual entity or an, somebody who embraces just violence and confusion. You know, I'm curious to know your insight or your, or your perspective on hip hop in general and male hip hop. You coming from a, a historical group, a legendary group in Public Enemy, and then to kind of see the evolution of where hip hop went from there to gangster rap to what we have today, to, to the dance rap to now what we have, but also what seems like a recent um, rash of violence. I know it's nothing new, but we're, we're able to see it in front of us now with the cell phone. What do you think about hip hop and how it's affecting the black male? Um, or what's your perspective on hip hop when, when it comes to coming to the black man? Are you talking about from the beginning of hip hop or are you talking about now? Um, okay, walk us through the time from public enemy to now. I, I'm interested to hear that. Well, I love hip hop. I always loved hip hop because I thought it was a forum, you know, and the only place that you could hear the thoughts, the ideas, and the fantasy of other young black uh, men and women. I uh, was closest to public enemy. Uh, at the same time, I appreciated other people's and other groups and other artists' storytelling, even if their storytelling wasn't the same or didn't have a political emphasis or anything like that. So back in the day, you know, I liked uh, Rakim, of course, and Big Daddy Kane, of course, and um, Dougie Fresh, of course, and you know, all, all of the MCs, I just loved the storytelling. Slick Rick, the storytelling I thought was phenomenal. And then the flow, just the way you put the words together. And then also uh, MC Light, uh, Latifah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I liked it all. As it moved on, uh, because time brings change, and it was more like uh, the Foxy Brown, the Little Kims. I I, I appreciated the 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 word, the way they maneuvered the words and delivered the words, but I didn't appreciate the meaning and the impact, you know, of of what they were saying because I felt like it was missing so much that our community needed. But I also realized that not everybody looks at themselves as a community servant. Some people just look at themselves just strictly as artists. And a lot of people resist or get angry if you try to force them into the role model you know, position. So I try to, with hip hop, listen to the storytelling, uh, the wonderfulness of the storytelling and not, you know, try to make everybody do what Chuck D did uh, or what I did or say the things that we say and, the, and be the things that we represent. For me to this day, Chuck D is the dopest MC, um, hands down, <laughs> because he had, the, he had the voice, the flow, the intelligence, the beats of the bomb squad 
uh, and the creativity of a you know a top tier artist, and he had it all blended into one you know one group. I thought that that was phenomenal. So even though other people told stories really well and had a huge impact on hip hop, they didn't cover as many dimensions as Chuck D covered, and that's why for me he's the number one MC. And talk about, you know, your time with Public Enemy and we can remember that message. It was a message of more of a revolution, a fight the power. And then you had like kind of right after that, and correct me if I'm wrong, this whole thing like gangster rap that came in. Now, my question is, do you think that it was a deliberate agenda by maybe like some of the record execs as an attack against Public Enemy and others to push a different type of music onto the people? Not a liberating music now, but and music that could be more self-destructing to a community? Well, I think initially I thought along those lines, uh, but when you're in the hip hop industry and you get to meet some of the people, some of the artists that are, that are delivering their messages differently and coming out of different neighborhoods and different you know, sides of the country, you start to appreciate it differently. For example, uh, I remember when I first heard NWA, I was just tight with the title, niggas with an attitude, what? You know, like who's out here naming themselves that? And that was my reaction. And Chuck was like, yo, you should listen to the music. You know, don't react to that, listen to the music. And I did, and I came to love like um, Ice Cube's rhyme flow and, and even MC Ren and Dr. Dre, like the whole thing. I became a fan of it, even though it wasn't what I represented or what I wanted to to say to my people. I thought that um, Ice Cube and his storytelling and the art and the way he put the rhyme together formed pictures in my mind, you know. And I thought he was I thought he was real dope at that, you know. So I don't have this kind of hardline thing that you know, or NWA was a conspiracy and mm -hmm. public enemy was a godsend. I think uh, Chuck put it best when he said, you know, rap is, is African Americans CNN because you got to hear all the different voices and all the different realities. I think before hip hop, the East Coast didn't really even know or understand the West Coast at all. We didn't have the same reality even though we all come from, you know, hood type of experiences. We didn't know about the, the helicopters flying over the hood all the time. We didn't know about the drive-bys. We didn't understand it. That's why Tim Dog was like, we want to know what you're fighting for. <laughs> because we on the East Coast couldn't understand, like, well, what's the deal? You know, what do they stand for? What are they fighting for? So at minimal, hip hop and the diversity in the hip hop gave us a means of communicating with one another. And I think each group influencing the other caused everybody to have to step up, you know, some levels. I think that the existence of Public Enemy actually influenced the existence of NWA actually influenced the existence of everybody that came after those, you know, two mainstay state hip hop groups. Great perspective. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about politics before I do that, though. I want to get your perspective on the two live crew and Uncle Luke down in Florida, because he was about the same time around the era of public enemy, although very different and down in music, but at the same time fighting the Supreme Court for the power to say what you want to say and speak how you want to speak on these records. What was your perspective on Uncle Luke and the Two Live Crew back then? Well, when you're a female in hip hop, you're always surrounded by men. And so you're going to encounter Two Live Crew <laughs> because you're surrounded by men. And they're going to be saying things that make you come aware of Luke and uh, uh, the Two Live Crew, even if you don't want to. Cause you're gonna hear them going pop that coochie, pop that coochie, <laughs> <laughs> saying something crazy, you know. Uh, so it's like this. Um, I think that you know, adult entertainment 
uh, has its place. And I believe in freedom of speech. I believe in that constitutional, you know, uh, freedom. And uh, because I believe in freedom of speech, I don't try to muffle or muzzle anybody else. But I also believe that if somebody comes through with anything that is going to mislead the community, uh, they have a right to do it, but expect some pushback. Mm -hmm. Expect somebody to either highlight it, uh, expose it, criticize it, you know, try to try to move it out of people's, you know, first state of mind and try to move people into another state of mind. But I love all of that. I love that, you know, somebody can put an idea out there and that you can fight against the idea that they put out there. I think it's a much better society uh, than a society where you cannot uh, express yourself. Absolutely. Trans Go ahead. Transition into politics. I wanted to ask you about that because it hip hop has played a very influential role in politics the last, let's say, 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I believe you were one of the first people to speak out against the Clintons because back then that was against the grain or even a couple years ago, that was against the grain to do because of our beloved Bill Clinton back in the 90s. or So we thought at that time. Um, and then we see what's going on today. We had the whole Trump effect. We see Biden, who was almost looked at as the savior for the black community. But it's been more the same no matter who sat in office for whatever reason. So I want to know what your thoughts are. Um, as we looked at the the political or we looked at the campaign that just passed the current president as he stands now and the previous president. Um, I think more about uh, our community than I think about the mainstream community. And I think if you don't have a plan and you aren't organized and you don't communicate with one another, you're always going to be chasing someone else's platform. It's the same like with technology, right? Uh, if you don't, if we don't create our own platforms, if we don't advance and excel in technology, you're always going to have to rely on the big major platforms. Uh, so I think it's the same way in politics. Like, we normally show up late and then we are normally disappointed. Uh, we normally don't trust and very suspicious. And all of these things are justifiable, but what isn't justifiable at this point is us not having built uh, institutions and independent parties and things uh, that are solid and, and things that are properly funded and things that are properly organized to represent and protect our interests. So I, you know, that's where I stand with all of that. I'm not a person who, uh, you know, sits around waiting to see who's going to be the, no the next president and think that my future hangs mm -hmm. on who's the next president, I would never even give one individual that much power. I think we would be much more effective if we could figure out who we are, what we believe, what we want, what we are willing to do, our work, our funds, our buildings, our institutions. I think that it's all past due. Definitely. Can you take us back to uh, to 92 and the Los Angeles uh, riots? Um, we were very young at that time, me and my cousin here, so we don't remember a lot about it. Can you take us back to that time and what the country was like, what the atmosphere in the country was like at that time when that went down? Atmosphere. Hmm. Well, um, at that time, I was just... Uh, a young organizer, a student organizer. And um, we were in a network of universities. Uh, so we would have student organizations 
in all of the universities across the campus. And that was the way that we communicated with each other. So I think at that time, you know, the atmosphere was very tense, uh, was very racially charged, was a lot of injustice, um, a lot of anger, um, anger, a lot of uh, feeling of powerlessness and a lot of disrespect mm -hmm. and a lot of disregard. And that was, those were kind of the elements that made up the atmosphere. So it was a very, you know, highly charged, highly energetic atmosphere. You know, when I went from uh, the East Coast, from living in Harlem, to visit the the uh, the neighborhoods on the West Coast in in L.A., Nickerson, Garden, Jordan Down, and all the different you know areas, it was mind blowing to me because I came from the projects in the Bronx, and the projects have a certain particular look. Mm -hmm. But as soon as I landed in California. I felt like everybody in California was privileged just based on the trees, <laughs> just, <laughs> just based, based on the grass and, you know, just the nature. I was like, and the sunshine and, and you know, the seasons and the way, you know, I was like, well, what are they mad at out here? Like, this is looks like paradise to me. So it took a whole education for me of going from hood to hood and attending some of the meetings that you know the young people were having and even at the the gangs were having to end the gang wars these are things that i saw you know up close and personal was in the same rooms you know with all of these uh people from these neighborhoods and i learned a lot uh more than i knew before I landed on the West Coast. So it just made me uh, more clear. Uh, and I'm a historian, so I love, I love all of that. I love learning the history, the culture, the reason, the roots. Why is this going on? What can help it to stop? Who is moving the action? Who is holding everybody back? And I was uh, a student of all of this at that time. Right now, can I ask right, you, now, can I ask you a question about, um, about um, I heard your interview, heard about interview years ago, years ago. your breakfast club. Your breakfast club. You said that you, you said, said that you know, know. that the Washington Post, you know, accused you of saying. Could you uh, take us back through that? And um, why I would they really, accuse? I really, you? I really don't want to. I'm I'm so exhausted of that thing. And I think at this point, you know, everybody knows me, and everybody knows what I'm about. And so I don't really need to go back to anybody who's trying to throw mud on my name or on my stance, on my reputation, or on my work, or on my contributions, or on my artistry. So I really, I'm really not interested in going there. Just know for sure that Sister Soldier is a person who has always loved Black people, mm -hmm. always loved humanity always tried to be a problem solver, never, ever lived the life of a troublemaker, always was unselfish, would share anything that I had, even the clothes on my back, and work with anybody with no arrogance and no snobbiness and no attitudes and no looking down or nothing like that. That's who I am, and that's who the hood knows that I am. So that is all that needs to be said. When you look at mainstream society, they always say things about the people that we as Black people know and love. Always try to discolor the contributions of the people who we know and love, mm -hmm. and always try to uh, be an obstruction to the servants because I consider myself a servant from way back, you know, a servant of trying to do the right thing. So let's just stop talking about them and what they think about us. And let's talk about us and what we need to do and who we need to be and where we need to go. And, you know, how we need every single person working 
and not just ride in the wave. Yes, man. Appreciate that. Um, how has your life and your influences through life um, influenced your writing? You look at the coldest winter ever, excuse me, the coldest winter ever, and you look at how much that's been received and the number of celebrities and people in power that have just resonated with the book. And then the anticipation, one of the highly anticipated books of 2021, Life After Death, um, the sequel to that, what inspires you? How, how do you get into the mode of an author to go, you know what, all right, this is how I'm going to lay this down brick by brick. This is how I'm going to create this. You know, everybody has their addictions, right? Mm -hmm. And my addiction is learning. I love to learn. Like, I love to learn something new. And I love to travel. I love to travel around the world. I love to research. And I love to study. I think the best authors are going to be the ones who love words, who love storytelling, who love research, and who are able to sit still and study so that they can deliver books that are at the top of their excellence. So for me, that's what it's all about. It's just, I just love words. I love storytelling. I love the people. And I love the fact that a book gives uh, an author an ability to uh, share a gift with the community without the community feeling like you're preaching to them or you're forcing them or you're judging them. Instead, we make a universe of characters and each reader gets to decide which characters they like, what resonates for them, uh, what lessons they wanna learn, what lessons they wanna leave to the side. So it's just a wonderful uh, profession and occupation and I'm really grateful uh, to to live the life of an author. Right. Can you talk about the uh, African Youth Survival Camp, um, putting that together? How was that whole process? Oh, yeah. Uh, the African Youth Survival Camp was my first uh, camp that that I and other college students put together uh, for the young people from the homeless population. So uh, it essentially was college students from all across the United States of America putting together a curriculum and gathering up the children that were living in the welfare hotels, which was a complete disaster. And we took children from ages, I'd say six to 16. And the, the 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 live thing about it was that we were only between the ages of 18 and 22. Mm. <laughs> and so the children at the camps were six to 16, we're between 18 and 22. And then the funding for the camp came from the hip hop concerts and the artists performing in the concerts were between the ages of 16 and 25. So it was really a legitimate, uh, organic, authentic, very genuine youth and student movement. Powerful. Absolutely. Um, your books. Now, I know there was some talk years ago about you taking your books and turning them into um, either movie, uh, but putting, putting them on screen. Well, where, where are we at with that now? Okay. Let me just say this. Uh, I have always seen my books as films. They play as films in my mind when I'm writing the books, each and every single one of them. But you know, Hollywood is its own beast. And I'm a person that already told you that I love reading. Mm -hmm. So if I get a contract, I'm gonna read it. And I'm not gonna be easily agreeable with something I don't agree with. So that is what is going to stretch out the process because Hollywood is going to say, this is customarily how it is done. And I'm going to say, it doesn't really matter that that's your custom. So many bad things are customary. And so I'm going to say, this is how it needs to be done in order for it to complement my intellectual property. And so there's going to be some push and pull. And to me, in a negotiation, there should be push and pull. 
but that's going to delay it and delay it and delay it. Maybe it's like a game of chicken. Everybody wants to see who's going to, you know, swerve, swerve off the road first. I don't know. But I just know that every era I see somebody who is a black artist and a genius on either the television or the cable network or the YouTube or talking on Twitter or Facebook or whatever, talking about the incredible work they did and how they don't have any money. Mm. And I think that that is a cycle that should be broken completely. You know, if I, if I see Dave Chappelle saying that his art is on Netflix and he is not getting a penny, I'm like, oh, hell no. Yeah. This is not acceptable. I think for many, many years, people have sold Black artists fame with no fortune. <clears throat> and I don't think fame should go with no fortune. I think if you're fame, you're famous and bankrupt, something obviously went desperately wrong. So for my artistry, I'm out here representing it creatively, but I'm also out here representing it financially. So let me say that there is a The Coldest Winter Ever movie deal. And we did hope to go into production before COVID hit. And now that COVID has hit and it's not finished, um, there is, you know, we have stepped back uh, from it, but we will return to it. Inshallah, we we'll return to it and and be able to bring the people a, a beautiful film. That's my that's my hope and my desire and my work. Good. Now, I've, I've, I've heard you say at times that you've seen the copycats in, in your work um, refurbished or, or re uh, put out on screen for other people and other characters to play in. That um, you weren't really into lawyers or lawsuits. You just worry about creating. But does it frustrate you to go into these meetings and see that they're not valuing your work from you directly, but then can go and outsource it pretty much and take content and recreate it on their own and, and make money from it? I know that you don't worry about the lawsuits, but does it bother you? Does it upset you? Um, it probably it probably upsets my family more than it upsets me. Because usually my mind is focused on something else, the next thing that I'm working on. So I don't focus on these little infractions. But I've seen all kind of stuff. I mean, they say imitation is the, the greatest form of flattery. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, I, I believe in the laws and the copyright laws. And I believe that people should respect people's art. And I think that if you are taking something from someone, you should uh, credit it. And if you are using something like somebody else's beat, somebody else's music, somebody else's storytelling, I think you should contact them and, and, and compensate them, have your company compensate their company properly. Uh, I don't have time to chase after it, but I see it all the time. I may even see somebody uh, rocking my same hairstyle that I had, you know, back in the day, speaking in my same cadence and the same rhythm, you know, uh, saying the same things I was saying. But I taught myself this. If somebody is imitating something good that I did, don't interfere. Don't interfere with that. You know, if they had more integrity, they would mention it at least. Uh, yeah. but I won't be out there trying to shut that person down. If that person is saying a good thing, doing a good thing, and it's going to have a good impact on people in our community, I'll leave that person alone. But just be clear, I'm not leaving you alone because I don't know that you're imitating and copying and borrowing and stealing from me. <laughs> I'm leaving you alone because, you know, uh, if you're doing anything good, I'm like, go, go get it. Do something good. Impact somebody in a positive way. 
move the culture in the right direction. You know, rah, rah, <laughs> I'm on your side. Right. And they list one of those places. Um, they said that reference your work was Orange is the New Black. Is that true? And are you aware of that? Well, I mentioned that on The Breakfast Club that my nieces, see, I don't watch the television. Mm -hmm. So I don't usually see, you know, what's happening. But my nieces always call me and say, yo, auntie, they doing your joint on. <laughs> and then they tell me. And it's not only that show. It's, it's a lot of different things, but it's okay. Uh, mm -hmm. They tell me. And like I said, my family gets more angry about it than I do. And I just, you know, try to stay focused, try to keep putting out new things. Sometimes I get a laugh at it. Like, say, for example, I haven't put out a book in a couple of years. And then I see the people who copy from me don't have any material. <laughs> Because <laughs> they're waiting for the book to drop. And then I'm like, I'll, I'll get a good laugh out of that. But that, that'll that be it. I'll just be laughing at it, you know. Uh, and it's just a confirmation that, you know, that's where you were getting it from. Because if I don't come out with the book, you ran out of ideas. Mm. We can relate on a lower level to that. We definitely understand. Mm. Appreciate your time. The, the, it was a great conversation, a wonderful Miss Sister Soldier. The book, Life yes, After yes. Death, is out now, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, today is publishing day. So it's in stores wherever books are sold and on all the digital platforms. And y'all didn't mention, and I didn't either, Nia Long is reading the audio book version of oh. Life After Death. So if y'all love Nia, like I love Nia. We do. <laughs> pick up pick up Life After Death, the audio book, and she'll read it to you. If you're the type that you just want somebody to read it to you, you don't want to read it to yourself. Beautiful. How's Nia Long? You, um, you know, we always wanted to meet ourselves. How does she as a person? <laughs> well, you should, you should call her manager. Maybe you'll get maybe you'll get to to meet her. Um, I think uh Nia Long is a beautiful sister. I love her. And everybody loves her. And when I was talking about having her uh, to perform the audio book, no one said no. No one said any bad thing about her. Even if I'm in a room full of women, they're all like, yeah, Nia. I'm like, yo, that's dope. <laughs> She's a woman who you can get all the women to agree about. That's perfect. Let's go with Nia. And mm -hmm. we did. That's dope. Now we definitely didn't know that. And that was um does it anybody does that exclusive or did you just give us something exclusive or people knew that? Ha, well, no, she posted. Okay. She posted and the shade room posted. So I'm damn sure I ain't exclusive now then. Okay, got it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but now nonetheless, we appreciate your time so yes. much. Beautiful Miss Sister Soldier on the Hip Hop and Sense of Podcast. If you may, right now you can give your lasting remarks, what you want to tell the people, anything inspiring. And then once again, please let them know where they can find life after death. Uh, you can find Life After Death in stores wherever books are sold. Uh, and you can find it on all of your digital platforms. You can download it. And you can find the audio book in digital or in uh, hard copy, you know, a CD version, uh, whichever you prefer. Um, I just want to say that, you know, my heart is always with the our people in the United States of America, and I really hope and pray for and fight for and push for um, a better country than we've had up until this point. I think that, you know, uh, I think that 2020 was a very, very difficult year for everybody. I think all of us lost something or someone in 2020. And I hope that it's a wake up call. I know for me, it is definitely a reconfirmation of a wake up call. And I try to humble myself. Uh, I try to uh, make my prayers with a sincerity, uh, be a good soul and a good woman. Because I think as we move forward, if us men and women don't humble ourselves, and do what we know in our soul is right and separate ourselves 
from the evil that has become very casual in our lives, I believe that we will lose even more. Powerful. Definitely appreciate your time. And yeah. since a soldier on the hip hop uncensored podcast. Yes. Thank you very much. Salute. Thank you. Good night.